Before we dive in, I have a quick favor to ask of you. If you haven't already, consider leaving a review on Apple Podcasts. More reviews, whether that's a five-star review or a written review, help us show up higher in the search results so more and more people can listen to the Farm Traveler podcast the more reviews we have. If you've already done that, or maybe you don't listen on Apple Podcasts, which is totally fine, consider sharing an episode with a friend or family member that you think might enjoy a certain episode. We now have a backlog of almost 100 episodes of great conversations with farmers, ranchers, entrepreneurs, and a whole bunch of other people in the food and agriculture space, so consider sharing one of those episodes. And as always, if you want to see more of our content, go to thefarmtraveler.com. Hello and welcome to the Farm Traveler Podcast. I am your host, Trevor Williams. And, you know, you might be wondering why you are listening to a podcast called Farm Traveler when today's episode we are talking about saltwater fishing. Um, I have a great explanation for you. So today actually it's kind of going to mark a cool little turn that we're going to take. Instead of only interviewing farmers, ranchers, entrepreneurs, others in the agriculture and food space, I'm going to start at least once a month doing additional episodes where I'm going to interview people that I am curious to learn from, that I think are interesting, and that, you know, I think they have a a good thing or two to share. And so I am trying to get into saltwater fishing, and I figured who else to reach out to other than a saltwater fishing expert, and I happen to know one, thanks to the Waypoint Outdoor Collective, which we are associated to with our podcast, and so I reached out to... Tom Rowland, who Tom was nice enough to actually have me on his show a few years ago. And so I returned the favor, had Tom on. Tom is a professional angler. He has several TV shows. He has a podcast, The Tom Rowland Show. Um, Saltwater Experience is one of his TV shows. And so I reached out to him, had him on, and he taught me a thing or two about saltwater fishing, specifically how to catch things like redfish, uh, flounder, mullet, a whole bunch of stuff, and how to like some boating tips, how to position your boat right, Um, what are some apps that you might need, like to check the weather or to check the fishing forecast, a whole bunch of really great info on saltwater fishing. So if you are interested to learn more about saltwater fishing, you will enjoy this episode. Or maybe you want a break from all of the ag-related content, maybe you will enjoy this episode too. So I figured it would be cool to chat with Tom to diversify our portfolio in terms of guests. And so I am super excited to see where this goes, to see how we can take it. And um, thank you so much for trusting me and for listening to this podcast. I'm super thankful. But anyway, thank you all so much for listening to the Farm Traveler podcast. And again, this is episode 95. We are getting so close to 100 um, with Tom Rowland from the Tom Rowland podcast, Saltwater Experience, and a lot of other really great saltwater fishing content. So I hope you enjoy this episode. Be sure to check out Tom at TomRolandPodcast.com and just search for Tom Roland on your favorite podcast app of choice and you will also see Tom and his podcast. So thank you all so much for listening and hope you enjoy this conversation with Tom. All right, well, Tom Roland, welcome to the show, man. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. So you are a fellow Waypoint Outdoor Collective um, podcaster. You had me on a few years ago to talk about farming and food and all that stuff. And I figured I'd have you on to learn a two or thing about about fishing. Nothing farm related. So you're a fishing expert, fit, um, fitness expert. So figured I'd pick your brain, man. So I'm excited to talk with you. Let's do it. I'm glad I'm glad you're on the Waypoint Collective. That's That's really cool. It's been cool to get to know so many different people, so many different walks of life and and interests and and uh you're you're definitely one of them thanks man yeah it's been cool to learn i mean i'm kind of different from a couple of the podcasts but i mean we're all outdoor farming fishing hunting it's it's a whole bunch of really good shows on there so i mean you've got a show saltwater experience you've got a podcast so give uh, my listeners a quick little background about yourself well uh my background i guess is that i've always been kind of interested in the outdoors i started i started um (laughs) hunting and fishing with my dad when I was just a little kid. Um, he actually favored the hunting a little mm. more than he favored the fishing. So I don't know if that's 
I don't know if that's just natural for me to favor the fishing more than the hunting because that's what he likes to do or, or whatever. But I was fortunate to have a dad that spent a, a good amount of time with me in the outdoors. That led me to uh, kind of getting away from it, I guess, when I when I had my when I got my driver's license. You know, I think girls and other things were maybe a little more exciting than, than going <laughs> hunting and fishing. But shortly after that, when I was in college, I decided, you know what, I really need to. I have a, I feel a, a, I'm being pulled like in a certain direction, like towards the outdoors. And I went to Yellowstone National Park and I worked there for a summer. And that was truly a life changing kind of thing. I had never seen Yellowstone. I had never, I had no idea. And, and I was completely blown away. And um, after that, man, I, I didn't know what I was going to do, but I knew I was going to spend a lot of time in the outdoors. And and that led me to become a fishing guide in Jackson, Wyoming. And then after that, after kind of trying to stay out there for a full year after going back to college and, and you know, going back and forth for a little bit, I tried to spend a, a winter in Jackson. And uh, it, was, it, was, it happened to be a winter that was very similar to like the last few weeks we've had in this country. Mm -hmm. And we experienced some 30 belows and I mean, real cold weather. And I just thought, man, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I could do this. And uh, so I went to Key West just for a fishing trip. And uh, when I got there, I was like, man, what is wrong with this? This is, this place sounds awesome. And so I figured out a way, you know, with help from friends, I had a, a friend there and he said, uh, it was kind of a funny situation. He said, um, you know, meet my, my roommate here and he happens to be moving out. He's going to move in with his girlfriend. And he's like, yeah, you could rent my room. And in fact, I got a boat. You could rent my boat. And I was like, really? And so this thing, this all kind of happened and uh, ended up guiding in Key West and actually doing both out West and, and Key West for a while. And then, um, you know, I wanted to get married. We decided that the one place we could make a living was Key West. And so I kind of quit guiding out West and we moved to Key West um, uh, full time, me and my wife. And that's where I built this, this guide business and started guiding uh, more than 300 days a year for about 12 or, or 14 years. And um, started doing a bunch of tournaments and all of that turned into something called saltwater experience which is our television show that we have that's been on the air for um i think 16 or 17 years now and um that one it was all about the the passion that that me and my partner rich have for um inshore saltwater fishing and just kind of what we did on a daily basis i mean it started out just kind of like guides day off that was the idea and then yeah. of course we've we've gotten some different stories <laughs> you kind of run out of that story after a while, but after 16 years, um, we start having guests and stuff like that. But that was that was the beginning, and and now we have uh, three shows: uh, Saltwater Experience, Into the Blue, and Sweetwater. And you know, I like podcasts. I, I listen to a lot of podcasts, so I thought I might be kind of cool to have one. And and I thought I'd do it for a year, and uh, I, I thought I'd do 52 episodes, one a week. Or no, actually, <laughs> I I I, would, I I planned on like maybe twelve, like one a month, and then then I thought, well, yeah, I got more to talk about than I thought, and so I started doing more more episodes, and now I'm turning out um, three three episodes a week, and um, I don't know, man, it's uh it's been quite a quite a journey, but that's the short short story. I like that. I didn't know that you were up in Wyoming for a while. I mean, yeah. I've been up there. We went there for uh, we went to Montana. For Christmas this year, and as a native Floridian, that was the coldest I've ever been. We woke up one morning and it was two degrees. I was like, yeah. "This is real cold." Yeah, you but I mean, I went to Key West. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, w were there a lot of like fishing things that were similar, whether you're out west or down south? I mean, were there well, kind of some tips, tips and tricks? Yeah, you know, the the western trout fishing. Um, when I, I grew up in Tennessee, and so all the fishing that I had done. Uh, was kind of murky water. I mean, occasionally, maybe you might think you saw a fish uh, in the water. And then when I went out west, I was really amazed at how 
you could see the fish before you ever even made a cast to them. So that's where it kind of brought in the hunting element of walking along a high bank, looking down into the river, and you could you could see where all the fish were, and you could pick out the one that you wanted to catch, and then you would make a stalk down there, not not unlike bow hunting or 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 turkey hunting or anything like that. And that whole element of being able to see the fish was what really drew me to the obsession that I, that I created, and that's very similar to what goes on in the Florida Keys. Almost everything that we do down there in the inshore salt water is seeing the fish first and then putting on, basically you're putting a stalk on this fish and you're doing it down there, maybe not necessarily all by yourself. I mean, there are some waiting opportunities, but a lot of that happens in teamwork where you have a guide on the back of the boat and you're on the, or, or, and the anglers on the front of the boat. You see a fish kind of doing its thing and you may have to take a big wide path around that fish so that you can get a cast to it without spooking it. And so the similarities between West and, and you know, the, the Southern saltwater, I think are mostly that, that it's very visual and it's a lot more like hunting than most people have ever experienced while, while fishing, which is kind of interesting, you know, like, like that's where, that's where I think people go head over heels for, for those two types of fishing. Like they'd never seen that kind of stuff happen. I know I hadn't. And that's why I got so into it. Yeah, no, I can imagine. So with those TV shows, I mean, what's the pressure of fishing with the filming crew going on? I mean, of course you want to catch something, but I know some days you just don't catch anything. So yeah. what's that pressure like? Yeah. Well, you know, there's a lot riding on it. Um, because I mean, when we first started, there was probably more riding on it because we didn't, we really didn't have enough money to do a, a, a production and you've got it, you know, back then we did it with one cameraman, but that cameraman's you know, getting paid more than either of us had ever been paid in our life. And uh, <laughs> uh, so you have, you have him and, you know, you're just hoping that the weather is going to be, you know, doable so that you can go out there and do what, what you had hoped to do. Um, and everything that we do is dependent on the weather. I mean, if the weather's good, we're, we got a pretty good chance of, of finding some fish. If the weather is bad, I mean, it's not unlike farming. I mean, there's not a lot you can do like you, mm -hmm. The weather presents challenges that you either adapt to and and overcome or, you know, some years it's a new thing. Like, man, I hadn't seen a drought go this long ever. Like, this is history making. And then, so what do you do? And and we have those same kind of things all the time with the wind, with the, with the, um, the super high tides or, or just mostly it's the wind. I mean... You get a wind that blows in and a change of, of, uh, of temperature and a change of barometric pressure. The fish just, they just act different. And, you know, a lot of places where you're sure they're going to be, they're just not. And, uh, and that's challenging. So when you have a film crew um, and a lot of money riding on it, that's, yeah, there's, there's a lot of pressure. But, but we had come from a lot of pressure. Like there's a lot of pressure when you just, take somebody out on a, on a guided trip. And, um, you know, you got somebody, I, I took all kinds of people fishing. I took blue collar people. I took executives. I took, you know, some of the richest people in the world and some people that saved all year long for that fishing trip. And, and to me, it was all the same. Like the guy that saved all year long for that fishing trip, you know, it was really his money. He might have more time available, but he didn't have a lot of money. So he, he's putting every penny towards doing a fishing trip with me. And I took yeah. that very, very seriously. And then on the other hand, of the, the, you have the CEO kind of guy that money's not an issue. It's his time, you know, and mm -hmm. he could be spending that time with his family or he could be spending that time doing something. And so I saw it all as the same, like high pressure situation. Like I need to produce, but in producing fish for this guy, I need to, you know, it's not all about fish. It's about having a, a great experience. And sometimes you can have the, sometimes the best days that you have, you don't really catch that much. And, um, you know, but the, the person goes away feeling like that was one of the most fun days they've ever had. And so we came from that kind of pressure on a daily basis. And then we fished in these tournaments all the time. And, um, 
you know, the tournaments would range anything from these ones that were called the Red Bone Tournament, and they were mostly for a, uh, a charity kind of thing. But your reputation was on the line. Like, mm -hmm. if you were, you know, it wasn't money that was on the line on those type of tournaments. It was your reputation. And if you won, you know, you, your reputation really expanded. But if, if you were a pretty hot guide and you didn't catch anything, man, your reputation took a pretty big hit. So there was that kind of pressure. And then eventually we started to do these, these professional redfish tournaments and there was a lot of money on the line. Um, and so there was a tremendous amount of pressure there. So I don't know that, that we experienced any more pressure with a film crew than we did you know, either on a daily basis or whatever, but I mean, there, there, there's, there's definitely some pressure there. <laughs> I mean, for sure. Um, I can imagine. Yeah. But maybe the easiest thing about all of that is, is actually going out there and catching the fish. I mean, there's the whole business to, to getting a, a TV show, a fishing television show or an outdoor television show going. And then there's additional pressure on, on it's, it's kind of easy to get it going. It's a lot harder to keep it going. And, um, you know, it's easy to, to be a good salesman and tell somebody that, you know, your production is going to be so good for their brand or they're going to sell so much product and stuff. But, but you know, they're, then later the rubber meets the road. And did you actually do all the things that you said you were going to do? And was it as effective as you said and all that? So those are certainly um, things to consider <laughs> on, on which is the more difficult. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And I mean, you brought up a good point. I mean, if you're taking somebody out, even a paying customer, I mean, you're going to have just as much pressure, if not more, whenever you're on, you're like doing a show. So that, I, I didn't think about that. That's a good point. Yeah. So I'm trying to get into bay fishing. I'm up here in Bay County. So we've got a really good bay for fishing. My wife and I bought a boat about, about a year ago. And quick little funny story. We went to take it out yesterday because yesterday was like the first nice day all year to take it out. We launched it, went to turn the steering wheel. Uh, the steering wouldn't go, so we we loaded it back up, and we were cranking it up. And this was a very well old used boat, and the crank broke. So now it's in oh the shop. So we're waiting till we get it back. But I mean, what advice do you have for bay fishing? I mean, fishing in grass, structure near bridges. We've got a lot of redfish, um, flounder up here that I want to try to start catching. So what all advice do you have for bay fishing? Yeah, well, the bay fishing, you know, I don't want to say it's easy. It's not, there's no there's no fishing that's easy, but um, you know, you're, you're a farmer and you, you know what the natural world is like and, and, um, fishing is, is not, not very different than that. I mean, the, the, the natural world presents the rules that fishermen can look to and, and kind of be able to, to have some, some success. And that is the, the fish that you're trying to catch are going to be where the bait is. Like if you know where the mullet are and you know where the pilchards are, then whether you realize it or not, you also know where the, the fish are. And the mullet migration is, is something to really pay attention to. And, and every time that you see, you know, you're riding around and you're looking, you know, mullet jump out of the water and mullet make muds and the, you know, they'll, they'll go down and they'll, they'll eat, um, you know, stuff off the grass and it makes this muddy area. And those are very, very easy to see. And those are things that you put like a mental note, like, okay, I saw a mullet mud over there. You know, I've seen mullet jumping out of the water over here. And wherever those mullet are, the redfish are going to be there and the trout are going to be nearby. And so those are all things that you all want to, you always want to be paying attention to. On a high tide, the mullet go over here. On a low tide, they're over here. The, the fish that are eating those things, they're going to follow with them. Now, they may not be right in there with them. Sometimes they are. but Wherever those mullet are is a is a your number one place to start looking for the fish that that you're looking for. And you know you've got you've got some real simple rigs that that pretty much everything eats, and that is a, a popping cork and shrimp. Mm. Um, that is you know it's a it's very effective, and you don't even have to have real shrimp. Like you can use like a a, a shrimp lure. And a popping cork, like a, a gulp shrimp or something that has has some scent to it. And so the popping cork, what that is, is are you familiar with that? Or yeah, mm -hmm. okay. So, well, for people that might not be familiar with it, you have this cork that's about two inches long, and it has a cupped face on it, and uh, usually a couple of beads on it. And this thing, this whole apparatus, sits on a piece of wire, 
And so you would tie your line to the top of it and you would tie a line to the bottom of it. The bottom, bottom would go to your, to your lure or your live shrimp. So there's a hook on the bottom with a live shrimp or a lure on it. And you throw this weighted cork out there, which floats, and you start pulling it along and popping it. And it sounds kind of like fish feeding and mm. um, fit, you know, the, the, the redfish and the trout, everything will kind of come over and look like if, if fish are feeding, they go over there, they check it out and there's a shrimp and they eat it and <laughs> it works. It works really, really, really well. So much so that a lot of people are like, nah, you're just using popping, popping shrimp and cork, mm -hmm. you know, uh, or popping cork and shrimp. But that's the great, that's a great way to get started. And it's a great searching lure. Like you always have to have these, these searching uh, things that you're doing, like something that you can cover a lot of area or something that you have a lot of uh, confidence in. And then once you catch a fish or two, if there's a different way that you'd prefer to fish, great. Well, at least you know that now you're in them. And, and that's super important. The confidence in fishing is 95% of your success. If you go to a place and you, you're like, I know there are fish here and you're going to try all different lures and you're going to fish that area a whole bunch, then you're probably going to catch them. But if you're, if you don't have a lot of confidence in the area make one or two casts and you move on and there could be tons of fish there, but you didn't put the time into it. So a lot of it is, is confidence and having that go-to kind of rig that, that you become good with and you become, you know, you, you become, you have enough confidence to where you're, you're thinking, well, if there are fish here and I fish this really hard for an hour, I should catch one or two. And if that happens and I fish really hard here for an hour with a shrimp and popping cork, then chances are there wasn't much here. And uh, then that's kind of how you would kind of move and, and um, you know, look around for some other, other type of areas, you know? Yeah. I think that that's what a buddy of mine and I use. We took a couple friends out on our boat a few months ago and we went to one area. A friend of mine caught a redfish and then he caught two puffer fish, but that's really all we caught over a span of like an hour or two. Yeah. But um, I, I think I've used the the corking pop once and I need to use it some more. We bought some for Christmas. So yeah, but everybody that I've asked to has like rent or had, has like raved about them. Yeah. Well, it's an aggressive thing. And when you see somebody that really fishes it, I mean, like you're pulling it. Like it's not, mm -hmm. it's not, the cork isn't designed like a, like a bluegill cork where, where you throw it out there and it just suspends the bait over the, over the grass and you just kind of wait. You, I mean, that probably works and you probably catch something like that. But when you actually are popping that cork all the way back, like it's kapoom and then let it sit, kapoom and let it sit, maybe kapoom, 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 and then let it sit for a little bit. And you're working that cast back to the boat. Then you cast another one over here. So you have two people casting in two different directions. You're covering a tremendous amount of water. All the mm. while, you're drifting across an area. So now, instead of putting the anchor down and throwing that cork out and just sitting there for an hour, you're covering, you know, lots of square feet or square yards of, of area. And then once you find the fish, once you get the bite, put the anchor down, put the power pole down and work that area really good until that bite stops, then start drifting again. And, um, you can have like the popping cork it and just the, the, the secret weapon. That's one thing you could have, you know, like a, a jig, uh, which is a, you know, like a hook with a, with a piece of lead on the front of it uh, that that's molded like that. And you can put these tails on it that look like shrimp or, or fish or whatever, like soft plastic types, or they'll have, um, you know, a jig like that, that is just, uh, have his bucktail on the back, a bucktail jig or a soft, a jig with soft plastic is, is another one where you just kind of throw that as far as you can. And, and, you know, using this braided line is a really good advantage because you're probably, if you, spool up with braid as opposed to monofilament, you're probably going to add 20 to 30 feet of line on your cast. Mm -hmm. So every time you're casting, you're casting 20 to 30 feet further than you would be with it with another that adds up so much over the day. So now you're covering more water and that's really what it's all about. You, you find a productive area with the bait, then you start to cover all that water. And then when you find the fish stop down and do your best to try to catch what's there 
when they stop biting or you're no longer having any success, pick up and drift on further. And uh, I mean, that's a that's a winning strategy right there. You know, that sounds the- like it. So how important is boat placement for all of this? I mean, you're trying to look for these good spots. You don't want to get close enough or sometimes you do. So how important is making sure you know where your boat is when you're trying to find a good fishing spot? Well, it's, it's really important for, I mean, for the most part, like the areas that you're fishing and that, that I'm fishing, um, sometimes the navigation can be tough. So you definitely don't want to run aground. So you want to know like where you are all the time. And, you know, there's, there's oyster bars and there's, shallow spots and and you don't really want to hit those you want to you want to fish around those but what's important for your boat is as you're drifting across these areas or or you're even using the trolling motor or whatever however push a push pole or however you're moving across something it's it's important to move but it's also super important to stop so if all of a sudden you know maybe you you've seen this before, maybe you haven't, maybe, maybe it's go, it's next time, but you're, you go out there and there's this rumbling water coming towards you and you're like, what is that? And that's a giant school of redfish. And so what's really super important is to stop just in casting range so that you can fish the front part of that school and just pick one off at a time. One, you know, you're not like throwing deep into the school. You're just picking off a couple on the edges. And you can sit there and catch tons of them. But if you let the boat flow, float right through them, you're going to catch almost zero. So the, the importance of, of like, I guess what you were saying is knowing where your boat is, is also being able to stop the boat. Like that's super important. And there's a, there's a cool invention, the power pole that is like this, it's an automatic anchor now that with a, with a touch of a button, this, this, uh, kind of pole extends down and goes into the ground, goes into the mud and will stop you there really quietly. You don't have to get the anchor out and bang it around in the boat because fish do hear those things and they are very spooky and they will, that will spook the whole school. So that power pole kind of has been an invention in the last 20 years that has really gone mainstream and almost everybody has them now. Um, but it's it's real important, and a lot of people, you know, ask us at the gas station, like, what what is that thing? Um, but that's what it's all about, and it's about it's about stopping the boat, you know, and and being able to to stop before you run over what you've found. Yeah, for the longest time, I had no clue what that is, but that is definitely <laughs> on the wish list. Um, <laughs> I've, I've heard nothing but good things about those. <laughs> if you tell somebody it's a manatee stabber, you'll get the mo- <laughs> you'll get the looks like you've never seen before. <laughs> I can imagine that's so funny. Yeah, we're that's one thing we're still trying to figure out because we'll take our our boat to Shell Island a lot. It's like a little weekend getaway mm-hmm. here. A lot of people go there, and so we're still trying to master the art of of throwing out the anchor. We've almost got it. We're almost there, but. Yeah, power pole would make things a whole lot easier. What 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 kind of trouble are you having with throwing the anchor? Well, we're just trying to figure out. Um, like, we'll try to get close enough to the island. It's kind of a quick drop off, and so we're yeah. trying to figure out throwing it deep enough to hold it. We're, usually, we can get the front one, but it's the back one that we'll put down a little bit in the mud to keep it from going from side to side. But then that one always drags a little bit. So I'm yeah. trying to do a better job of like kicking it deeper into the mud so it stays there. But um. It's fun. It's fun. It's a good little hobby boat. Yeah. But um. so, yeah. Yeah. So what about fishing for flounder? One of my favorite things is fried flounder. Mm-hmm. And I want to try that. I've got some weighted jigs that we've tried that before. We have fished around a bridge once and there's a marina down here that we try a couple of times. So do you have any um, advice for flounder? Well, flounder is a, is a fish that I've fished for a good bit. Um, growing up in South Carolina, we used to do a lot of flounder fishing. Um, we don't have a lot of flounder in the Florida Keys. So everything I say, some flounder fisherman out there is probably going to say, I don't know what I'm <laughs> talking about. And I might not know what I'm talking about, but I do know this flounder. Um, you know, they're, they're a very interesting fish. They live flat on the bottom. So whatever you're doing needs to be close to the bottom. Now they will try, they will try, uh, chase something down and they can be very aggressive, but they're not a tarpon and they're not a, they're not a tuna and they're not a barracuda. Like they don't have that kind of mobility. So flounder fishing is kind of slow and close to the bottom. They love live shrimp. They love live baits. And, um, and they are 
fantastic to eat. You can also gig them, you know, and there's yeah, a season yeah. for, for gigging the, the, the flounder. And, you, you know, if you can get in, in shallow enough water, you can go out there at night and you can uh, use a headlamp. And I know that's a ton of fun. Uh, you see their, their eyes and, you know, they get kind of underneath the sand a little bit. They, they get sand all over the top of them and they're really hard to see. Um, but that gigging them is a, is an effective way to do it. But kind of, uh, you know, that popping cork and, and, and live shrimp will work for the flounder too. And the trick to that is making sure that you know what the depth of the water is and, you know, getting your bait. So, you know, if it's four feet and you're, you're drifting your, your shrimp, you know, two feet, I mean, a flounder might come up for two feet, probably will, but you know, just imagine how much more effective it could be if that was, you know, six inches off the bottom. Um, so the depth of the water, I think, is really super important. Gotcha. That makes sense. Okay. So in addition to all this fishing stuff you do, you've got the shows, you've got the podcast, you're also really big into fitness and you've been doing, um, like you, like you were saying, you have a fitness episode on your podcast weekly and you've got these new monthly challenges. So what kind of, what was kind of the inspiration behind the whole fitness side of your stuff? Well, um, the inspiration was simple. Um, I was a, I was an athlete growing up. I was a wrestler and, um, uh, you know, stayed, in, stayed in good shape. I didn't have any choice. I mean, you pretty much, you could get out of shape in the summertime, but I was always like water skiing and stuff. And I didn't even realize I was staying in pretty good shape by doing that. But, you know, you could eat whatever you wanted to, but sometime around September, you'd have to start getting your weight back in check and you'd have mm-hmm. to get ready for the season. And, and then when that all kind of st- stopped and I ate for a full year, I got pretty out of shape, you know, quite honestly. And, uh, and that was about the time that I was starting my fishing career. And a couple of weird things started happening. Like I was out west and I hurt my back real bad pulling the anchor up. And I'd never hurt my back before. I didn't have any idea what that was all about. And um, then when I went down to Key West, I, I started fishing down there and some of my friends, they could go for six, eight, 10, 12, 15 days in a row. And I was having a hard time going for three or four without just being completely exhausted. And, and, uh, I I was a young person, you know, I'm 22 years old. I'm like, what is going on? (laughs) And I just started to realize, man, you know, if you take a little bit better care of yourself, you can do a, a lot of things are easier. So the, I started to you know, do it by just covering up, you know, the Florida sun is super, super intense. And Mm -hmm. I noticed that, you know, if I wasn't wearing shorts, if I wore pants instead of shorts, I felt so much better at the end of the day, long sleeves versus short sleeves, so much better, you know, a big hat, you know, versus, you know, no hat or a a baseball cap, just all, all, all started feeling so much better. And I could, instead of going, you know, three or four days and being exhausted, I could go four or five or six days. And then I started thinking, well, man, if that, if that makes such a difference, I wonder, like, what if I drank more water, <laughs> you know, like just simple things, but you're 21 years old, you know, you know, you don't really know how to take care of yourself yet, but started noticing that, you know, if I, if I ate a little better, if I, if I really drank a lot of water, if I stopped drinking so much beer, man, now I could go like 10 days. And then I started, um, well, I stayed about like that for a while. And then when my wife and I got married, I noticed like I need to work more, like a lot more. If we want to do the things that, that we wanted to do, we wanted to have family and all that. And I just, I mean, the limiting factor was physical condition. I could get the trips, but I was like, man, I, I can't go, you know, 15 days in a row without a day off. And um, so I started getting in better shape and I started running and I started, you know, doing a lot of, um, calisthenic exercises and stuff like that because I didn't have a gy- access to a gym or or anybody to work out with so I just started running and man it was not very long I started losing a little weight I started feeling better and I was going 30 days in a row no problem so it was a very one-to-one relationship the better shape I was in the more money I was making so it was a one-to-one relationship about you know the better better shape I was in the more the more money I could make, the more trips I could book. And, uh, you know, it became kind of a habit. And then it became more than that. Like I started to really enjoy the process and I started to kind of, the motivation was, was almost purely financial. The, but there was, 
there was more to it. Like I just felt like I was getting in better shape. And then we started to start uh, talking about having kids. And I was like, man, I want to, I want to lead by example. You know, I want my kids to Mm -hmm. see me taking care of my body and doing it because I like it, not doing it because it's some sort of drudgery or that I have to do it like doing it because I like it. And so, you know, that's, I'm kind of, kind of like that with my personality like it's you know all all or nothing and uh so i get into something and i I really get into it so i started running marathons and and um and that was cool but then just started finding other other ways of training that i that i liked even better that i that were more beneficial to the fishing and uh you know before long i think my record was 175 days in a row without a without a day off shoot and, uh, that's that's impressive yeah well I, I mean but it all boils down to to the fitness and it all boils down to uh to taking care of your body and you know the guy there's a guide a typical kind of guide body like you go to the you go to the marina and you'll see a bunch of fishing guides and most of them look about the same and they got big strong shoulders and a big belly and <laughs> It's just kind of, I don't know, I, that's just what that lifestyle kind of leads to. There's a lot of heavy lifting. There's a lot of, uh, you know, you know, carrying things. There's, uh, you know, your, your hands have to be very strong, but there's not a lot of cardiovascular moving around. So you get this big kind of powerful looking person with, that's kind of heavy and, and kind of out of shape. And that leads to back injuries and, and all kinds of stuff. And I just didn't really want that to be me. And um, it, it paid off big time. And it just became so obvious that the better shape I'm in, the better decisions I'm making on the boat, the better mood, mood I'm in all day, the, the better um, entertainer I am to my customers. And just the more I did, the better I was. And, and it was a one-to-one relationship. I just saw that super clearly. Um, now I'm not guiding every day and I continue to, to work out like that. And, um, I don't know. I I think I'm just, I'm, I'm lucky in, in a lot of ways that, that I find it, um, fun. And I think a lot of that has to, goes back to high school wrestling. Like that's kind of what we did. And it was always kind of fun, uh, to, to go hard. But but I like it. I, I like to I like the working out. I like the feeling I get after after doing a hard workout. And and certainly the results um, have have certainly helped me in my career. Yeah, I've seen some of your videos. I don't know if it's your house or a home gym, but I've seen a lot of your workouts with a lot of your buddies, and they look super intense. <laughs> well, um, yeah, some of them are. Some of them. Yeah. Are. <laughs> So what about the inspiration behind these monthly challenges? I think this month is what, like 10,000 push-ups? Yeah, yeah, 10,000 push-up challenge. We did this, uh, this is the second year that that I've held this, you know, around the podcast. Um, you know, I have something called the TRP, Tom Rowland Podcast Fitness Challenge. And and some of them are, are really, you know, pretty challenging and some of them are pretty easy and some of them, you know, require a lot of discipline and some of them, some of them require a lot of effort, you know, to do certain things. But, but the idea is just to inspire people to, to take a little bit better care of themselves. Because I think a lot of people that are into fishing and hunting and stuff like that don't, maybe, maybe they don't understand how much better they could be at the activity that they want to do if they were in a little bit better shape. And so the first challenge I came up with was, was get 20 minutes of exercise for 20 days in a row. Like not all of them are like 10,000 push-ups or 3,000 pull-ups or something like that. Mm-hmm. Just just 20 minutes of exercise, any kind of exercise you want. You can walk for 20 minutes and do that 20 days in a row. And you know, the 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 feedback on that was was fantastic. I mean, people were doing it with their kids, people were doing it with their wives, their wives were doing it with their husbands. And people were getting out, and I thought, okay, well, that that that's cool. Let's let's ramp it up a little bit and and try something else. And so the ten thousand push up challenge is something that that I've done a bunch of different times uh, in my life. And you know, it sounds sounds pretty hard, but it's really it's three hundred thirty three push ups for thirty days, and or maybe three hundred thirty four push ups for thirty days will get you over ten thousand. 
Um, but that, you know, that sounds like a lot, but it's 10, it's 33 sets of 10 throughout the day. You got, you know, 12 hours, you, you, you spread that out. It's not really that bad. And it's really, it's, that one is really more of a, a, a an exercise in discipline than it is uh, an endurance challenge or something like that, or a strength challenge. Because I feel like anybody can do 10,000 push-ups unless you got some sort of injury or something. But if you're pretty healthy, I think anybody can do it. And and a lot of people that have done it, I mean, we had hundreds of people do it last year. We're having hundreds of people do it this year. And most of the people that finish, I mean, you got your your stud gym rat kind of guys out there that are like, you know, finish it in 15 days and, and they're done <laughs> with it. But then you have so many of these other people that are just like, man, I saw that and I thought that was completely impossible. And my friend did it and I didn't understand how he could do it. So I tried it. And then they do it. And and to hear somebody kind of have that kind of you know, realization that they can do more than they thought they were, than they thought they could is, that's pretty cool to me. I really like that. I think that's, I think that's pretty cool. And uh, if one of these silly little challenges can make a few people feel like that, then then it's certainly worth doing. That's awesome. And I mean, it seems like these challenges, especially like the push up one, it leads to them doing more. They see that they can do 10,000 push ups yeah. than they thought previously they couldn't. And so they do. Um, a whole bunch of other ones. I've seen in the past that you've done, I don't know what it's called, but it's like you shower really cold, really hot, really cold, really hot. Mm -hmm. I've seen all that stuff before. Um, and I followed the guy that you recommended for that. And his thing was really cool. And I tried that for about a month. The first couple of days, it sucks because it's really cold. And I do not like cold water. But afterwards, you kind of start to notice the difference. You're like, you know what? I'm kind of more alert. I'm more awake. Like maybe there is something to this whole cold shower thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's the Wim Hof. Wim Hof is a <laughs> is a it's basically a crazy man from Amsterdam. Uh, but he's on to something. He's he's really on to something. And his whole program is centered around this breathing method that he does, which is basically forty or fifty deep inhales and exhales, and then you you breathe in one more time, you let everything out, you hold it right there. And then one more big, big, deep breath in after you held that with no, no air in your lungs for as long as you can. And then one big, deep breath in, you hold that as long as you can. And that would be one round. You do three or four rounds of that. That's one part of his, of his training. And that's, that's been very beneficial to me in a lot of different ways. The cold is another one of his, another leg of the stool. And that is uh, where he gets in some, you know, ice water. And he's doing it all the time. I do it maybe once a week. Um, and I like to do it where I get in the, the ice for maybe 10 minutes, and then I get in the sauna for maybe 20 minutes, and then the ice for five minutes and the sauna for 15 minutes, and then the ice for two minutes and the sauna for 10. And, and um, I love that. And it's like this, it, it's kind of a recovery after, the, after a hard week of training. That's kind of a, a good way for me to recover. But I think there's a, I mean, if you listen, he's been on Joe Rogan a whole bunch of times and, and they're fascinating because I mean, at first when you hear Wim Hof, he sounds like he's completely crazy, but <laughs> he has all this science to back it up. Like people have thought he's super crazy. So they bring him into the lab and he's like, no, I can, I can manage all these things that, that have previously been thought, you know, that they're, autonomous like you can't you can't do anything with these these systems in your body and he's been shown that he can actually manipulate you know all kinds of things in his body that science and other people have thought were completely impossible and they test him and test him and test him and he can do it and <laughs> they think well okay well you're just a freak and he's like no I can teach anybody to do this bring in 20 untrained people and he'd put them through something and they would test it. And sure enough, he could teach other people how to do it. So he's on to a whole different level of, of understanding. I love finding out things like that and incorporating them into my training where it makes sense. The Wim Hof breathing and the cold water has, has certainly been beneficial. Um, but, you know, 
there's a whole bunch of other ones that I've tried that I don't continue to do. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> it, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, it's pretty cool, but I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to do it every single day. Uh, lately, it's been it's been this stretching program to where like uh, I've been doing a tremendous amount of stretching, and um, and that has been really beneficial um, in a lot of ways. Just in, in in the way that I feel, in the way that that I'm moving, everything is seems to be a little bit better with with a lot of stretching. So I don't know as as you kind of age and your training does need to change and you do need to kind of alter your training a little bit to allow for more recovery. I mean, I'm 52 and, um, that's not, that's not old, but it's certainly not 25. And so I've, I've started to, if if I'm going to train as hard as I have always trained, I need to spend a lot of time and effort on recovery and do a lot of research and, and try to find ways that I can recover faster, ways that are more effective to recover. Um, and the breathing and the cold water and the stretching are all really, really important pieces of that. Yeah, that's something I never realized until I did like some more research on like getting fit and fitness and all that, that the recovery process is oftentimes just as important as the regular fitness. I mean, you've got to make sure your body has everything it has to recover. So that the next time you go to work out, you can still get some really good gains. So that's, yeah. I mean, that's something that I feel like a lot of people don't realize. They just go hard at the gym and then they rest for a day and then they go back to the gym a day later. Yeah. And, and, you know, young people can do that. And, and even some old people can do that. And if you're, if you're kind of untrained, um, you know, you're going to experience amazing uh, changes and benefits when you first start to exercise and stuff like that. Uh, but the big, the big piece you know, for young people and old people, the big piece that seems to be neglected and missing, there's two really. The stretching is definitely one and sleep. You know, sleep is, Mm -hmm. sleep is, is, it's, it's mandatory. I mean, I don't know how many people listening have ever tried to go, you know, 48 or, or, or 60 hours without sleep. But I mean, weird things start to happen. I mean, the human body needs sleep and you need it on a, on a, level that that supports everything else that you're doing so as you ramp up your training you need more sleep you know that's how your body recovers and and there are ways to get better sleep and and that's a real big piece of of i I think that what what some people especially younger people kind of uh ignore or don't think that they need um but I don't know. There's a book called uh, Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker, and he goes into all these different um, case studies about Olympic athletes and different different people where they were somehow able to test them. And they just by getting more sleep, they improved like. A lot of percentage points Mm -hmm. and, you know, you can see it with with young kids um, you know, when they're studying for tests, what, if, if they can get a good night's sleep before a test, and there's a ton of research in that book about this and great, lots of ton, tons of examples about the difference between a, a kid getting a good night's sleep or cramming for the test and, um, you know, staying up really super late. And the kid that, that gets a really good night's sleep generally does considerably better. Um, you know, but in my case, I waited until the last second to learn everything that I needed to learn for the test. So <laughs> I was <laughs> I was the crammer. But uh, all about cramming, yeah, same yeah. If I if I had just gotten a good night's sleep, my grades would have been way better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that I've struggled with sleep for a while because I'm always like, well, I'll go to bed late, wake up late. So that's something I've got to get better at being kind of like regimented with getting seven, eight hours of sleep daily. But read I mean, that, that's that one book, of the things. Man. That that book is it's eye opening or closing. I guess you could say. I, <laughs> in, in a good way, in a yeah. good way, I close it. <laughs> well, Tom, that's awesome, man. Man, you cover everything fitness related, fishing related. Uh, this popped in my head before I forget. Do you have any recommendations on like apps or websites where you can get good um, water updates, like how the tide is, how the weather is, stuff like that? Um, yeah, let's see which ones. I got my phone right here. I have to look and see which ones that I that I use the most. Um, 
Like I, I think have... now, right now, I've got fishing points. I've got that one. Okay, that one's pretty good so far. Yeah, that one's that one's good. Um, I like as far as the wind, which is probably the most crucial element to mm -hmm. to our fishing. I use one called Windy, Windy, and it's a red. It's got a red square with kind of two white little things that kind of look like a W. Windy is a great app. You can you can look at that and get anywhere you 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 want to go. Like I can put it on Key West right now. It's blowing nine knots, and it will tell you like what it's going to do today, tomorrow, for the next five or six days, with really incredible accuracy. Hmm. And okay. um, that that is really good. Both the wind direction, the wind speed. Um, that is would be my highest recommendation as far as the wind. I also use one called My Radar Pro, and this is where I use. This is the one that I use for, like, if is there a front coming? Is there a storm coming? How far away is the rain? There's a big rain cloud right there. Is that ten miles thick or is it one mile thick? You know, and you can. Yeah. This thing is surprisingly accurate. And you can overlay the wind direction and the wind speed. That one I like a ton. And then mostly as far as the tide goes, I just get all my tide information from NOAA okay. and uh, from, from any kind of NOAA published thing. And what, what a lot of these apps will do is they'll just, um, that's public information, the NOAA information. So they'll just pull all the public information in and a good app, you know, there's probably a ton out there that would show me all three of these things that I just told you about in one app, but I don't know what they are. And I just go to these, I just go to these same, same three apps. And then I take a little bit of information from here and a little bit of information from here and a little bit of information from here. And with that, I make my own determination about exactly what's going to happen right in front of me in the next 20 minutes. If I go 20 miles to the West, um, all of that stuff is is uh, is important. There may be better apps that could um, organize that data for you, um, but those are the ones that I use. And and any sort of NOAA, you know, the the NOAA National Marine Forecast. That's the one I watch the most. Gotcha. Yeah, those are helpful. Yeah, I haven't found anything that's like any one app that's perfect. So I might have to do what you do and have a bunch of different apps for different purposes. Yeah, but as long as you're, you know, like like if you get on an app and it says you know, the NOAA national marine forecast. I mean, that's, that's actually the NOAA. So, I mean, that app is just pulling from somewhere else. So that's good data. I mean, okay. that's, that's a, that's the best forecast you're going to get. Um, so as long as it says that you're good to go. Gotcha. Well, that's perfect. All right. Well, sweet. So if people want to listen to more of your show, listen to more about fishing, fitness, all that good stuff, you're on the waypoint outdoor collective, uh, where else can they go to listen to you? Um, well, anywhere there's podcasts available. We just got on Amazon, I think, or Spotify, all those type of places. Um, anywhere podcasts are, we should be. Just look up uh, Tom Rowland Podcast. My name has a W in it, R-O-W-L-A-N-D. Um, and uh, you should be able to find it. We're also, uh, I do a video uh, portion of it, and that's on YouTube. It's also on Waypoint. It's on, uh, I don't know, I guess those are the two places that that, that lives. Um, so you can either watch it video or you can listen to it audio either way. Um, you can go to the website, TomRolandPodcast.com, and that has all the, the previous episodes and descriptions and all that too. Well, sweet. Well, awesome, Tom. Well, thanks again, man, for um, all this fishing advice. I can't wait to give it a try. As soon as we get the boat back, I'll let you know how it all works out. But I appreciate it, man. All right, man. I hope you go get them. Thanks for having me. Hey, again, thank you so much for listening to this episode with Tom Rowland of the Tom Rowland Podcast and Saltwater Experience. If you enjoy this episode, I know it's a little bit different. Consider sharing with a family member or a friend that might get a thing or two out of, you know, learning how to do saltwater fishing effectively, or even fitness, which is what Tom talked about a whole lot, and that's kind of his, his whole thing too, fishing and fitness. So consider sharing it. Thank you so much for listening. And if you have any questions or if you want to see or listen to, rather, any more of the over 95 
podcast episodes of Farm Traveler, go to our website. It's thefarmtraveler.com. You can see all of our podcast interviews there, a whole bunch more of articles from our past guests, and even a few guest author pieces. So again, that's thefarmtraveler.com, and we will see you next week.